How's it going, everybody? Thank you for being here. You're about to watch or listen to another one of the episodes of the 2023 Outlook series. On this one, I'm joined by Joseph Wong. He's, um, I suppose most of you know who he is, but he's an economist, um, also an OSIS lawyer, um, but also an ex-banker. He's also an ex-credit analyst, and he now runs Monetary Macro, which is uh, an investment management firm. Um, I guess take it that way. He's pretty much everything you and I would would like to be one day, but are unlikely to become, at least for myself, because I'm not as hardworking. But he's here to talk about uh, macro and his outlook on the stability of of the system, dollar inflation, whatever, whatever we might end up talking about. What he's not here to do, though, is give you or, or anybody really financial nor any other professional advice of any sorts as this will be a conversation that's general and impersonal in nature, one that will include a lot of forward-looking statements and um, forward-looking statements, stuff that you shouldn't really blindly trust. And you should always double, triple check whatever somebody on the internet says, because again, we're not here to make anybody any money. We're here to just have a conversation. So Joseph, with, with all that said, thank you for investing your time with me, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. The pleasure is, of course, all mine. I'm uh, very grateful that you answered my my, my email and that, that we're actually talking here today. So it's very kind of you, especially, I, I assume, well, you, you can tell me more about that, but I assume that, that you're being asked on, on many different shows, especially with what's happening right now. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I This is my uh, second one today. I got two more to go. I'm going on uh, actually TV in, in a bit too. So it's, uh, it's kind of a... You know, you, you specialize in something like the banking system, and most times a bank is a banking system is fine. But today, as we're recording, we have some big changes. One of a, uh, I guess, a medium-sized bank went bust, and you have some new Fed lending facilities. So, you know, in this once in a, you know, blue moon moment, people want to hear something about that, and I study it. Right, it makes sense that they would be invited. Then, um, just I don't quite understand most things and this is even more complicated to me um but so far what i'm understanding is that this is the the svb fail was sort of um a special case they call it idiosyncratic to use a fancy word it's a special case of a bank that was not well run um but it doesn't really pose great contagion risk to the system as the system is also well capitalized overall is that like am i making any sense there yeah 100 percent. so I think what's happening right now is that a lot of people are seeing that a bank failed and they immediately think back to what happened 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, we had a great financial crisis, which was ultimately a banking crisis. Lehman mm. Brothers failed, but other banks failed as well. And so because we're colored by that experience, immediately the, the, the impulse is to panic. But I think what people don't understand is that the banking sector has changed a lot today over the past 10 years. One thing, for example, is that, you know, pre great financial crises, the banking sector had not very much liquidity. Now we've had trillions and trillions of dollars of quantitative easing. Now, pre GFC, the banking sector maybe had 50 to $100 billion of cash held at the Fed. Today, they have, you know, almost three and a half trillion dollars. That's a big difference. Pre GFC, we had a lot of uh, regulation was pretty lax especially I think in the Eurozone banks as well. Mm -hmm. And then we had these global banking se sector standards called Basel III that were very strict. And Basel III standards made banks basically really boring businesses. They had a lot of constraints as to what the assets the banks can buy and also made sure that they managed their liabilities, their deposits very prudently. And so banks, especially big banks, basically became giant boring socialized companies. Um, that, that's why they're really safe today. But one thing, though, that the regulations didn't do is that they didn't kind of cover all the banks. So if in, in the U.S., and the same in Eurozone as well, the type of regulations that you come under depend on how big you are. So if you are a smallish or medium -ish bank, you fall outside of the cracks of the regulatory framework. And so in that case, it's possible for a bank to behave badly. And that's really what happened here. You have a regional bank, Silicon Valley Bank, behaved badly and then went bust, just like you mentioned. Now, I'll give you some context. Silicon Valley Bank, $210 billion in total assets. The biggest bank in the U.S. is $3.5 trillion. So Silicon Valley Bank, not even a tenth the size of J.P. Morgan. Hmm. It's not a big deal. Uh, it's just causing a lot of uh, panic right now. Hmm. So, yeah. So the, the way that I... 
it's causing a lot of panic, but it's also causing, I guess, a lot of newsletter writers to 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 sell a lot of newsletters by by um, you know shocking titles and stuff like that. So that always works. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. It is. These yeah. things are big. Better attention grabbing because it's close to home uh, for most people. And this, I, I guess, this is also something I can ask you about. Is that this is not, you know, it's it's not system related. It's very it's very business related. You know, if this was a, 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 a I have a cafe. If I manage my cafe badly and I fail, it doesn't mean all cafes in my city are going to fail. That's sort of what, what I'm getting at. But so the system isn't in danger as it was uh, during the GFC, where most of the and the biggest banks were also over leveraged, um, and, and and that is correct. But what about that aspect? Because why do these titles work in the first place? Is because it hits home, right? Like it hits close to home. So what about what what about the the human nature aspect of it? And and you know, actual bank runs that might be happening on like regional banks because of people getting scared because of these headlines and because you know most people like myself don't really understand what's happening. So I might be scared. I run to the bank. I have twenty, thirty thousand, whatever I might have in the bank, and I take it out. Like, could that happen? And how much would that hurt the system? You make a good point. So, <clears throat> so, so today, if you look at the stock market, you'll look that the big banks, not that much, not much, they're, just, they're down a little, but the smaller banks, especially those that are also located in the Bay Area, for example, First Republic Bank are down significantly. As of recording, First Republic Bank looks like it's down 50% uh, today. So that's that's a big chunk. And that is in part because of the psychological aspect you mentioned. People who deposited money in Silicon Valley Bank saw that their bank go under and other people who probably know them because they're in the same region, uh, bank with the First Republic, and then they get worried too. Maybe First Republic is also going down. So there's definitely a psychological aspect to this where uh, people can definitely panic. Now, the way that traditionally the regulators have treated this was through two ways. One is that the Fed is there, the central bank, standing as a lender of last resort. So if everyone panicked and started withdrawing money at the same time, the bank could then borrow money from the Fed uh, through the discount window, so emergency lending, and have enough cash on hand to meet those withdrawals. That's one way. The other way to do this is something called deposit guarantees. And so what happens in the U.S. is that the U.S. government guarantees up to $250,000 worth of deposits in your bank. So if you are a retail depositor, you really have nothing to worry about. Uh, even if the bank goes under, you'll get your money back. So that's how the that's how the system handles this. And so far, it seems like um, it's been localized. So you could have some problems with First Republic. But if you look across the nation, across the regional banks, they're also down a bit. But uh, in, in my view, you know, someone who banks with a local bank in, let's say, uh, Georgia is is probably not all that attuned to what's happening in uh, San Francisco or even what happens in the news. Hmm. What about something? And I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, but what about something like a, a butterfly effect or or whatever, where um, you know startups don't have access to cash, they go in, in problems. People who are working there don't have don't don't have you know money to go out as much, and the cafes close, and on and on and on. Is that like could could it get? bigger than than San Francisco itself so the so the the government basically bent the rules to prevent that from happening so like I mentioned normally the deposit insurance is up to 250,000 now the government bent the rules and made sure that everyone no matter how much money you had in the bank was fully insured at Silicon Valley Bank now this is kind of you know this is this is something new and that prevents any daisy chain effect that you mentioned but I think there's also cost to this as well. So, you know, we want we want a bank to be well run. And one of the ways that we can do this is to make sure that people put money in the bank are making sure that their bank is competently run. And we want banks that are poorly run to go under. Right. That's that's basic competition in the marketplace. Now, we don't want retail depositors to, to have to worry about this. So we give them a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar guarantee. But a lot of the people who bank with Silicon Valley Bank now, actually, almost all of them were either rich people or basically corporations. And uh, I say this because over 90% of the deposits of Silicon Valley were uninsured, so they don't really have any retail deposits. Now, from what I'm hearing now is that many of these companies were holding hundreds of millions of dollars into Silicon Valley Bank, and that's really not the right thing to do. If you are a well-managed company, you manage your cash in a way that you don't have so much exposure to one bank. 
but you have a lot of people here who manage to cash badly and are paying the price for it. Uh, a good thing to do would have been to basically let the process play out. And so you, you guys taking a big risk here, you lose some money and that makes everyone more careful about managing risk. So banks become more careful. That makes the system stronger. But what you're doing now is you're taking away any reason for, for anyone to ever care about how the banks manage their business. And that creates the potential for even bigger bad choices. Hmm. Are there like when I'm talking to you, I'm I'm getting a lot of a, a lot more of a calmer vibe. I guess that's how you always are in in, in interviews. And that's how you are as a person. But it's like when I, when I, when I read the headlines, I'm getting one vibe. When I talk to you, I'm getting another vibe. And it almost sounds to me like you're saying, you know, this is. I mean, like you said on Twitter today, this is overblown. But at, at, could this be maybe some sort of an a, a attention averter from what's to come in the CPI or what the Fed is about to do? Could this be an excuse for the Fed to start cutting or something else that might be happening in the background? And this is just to take our attention away from that. Yeah, I, I think sometimes that the, the, the government definitely tries to, uh, I guess, influence public opinion by planting stories or influencing the media, right? We, we see this happen very clearly during COVID where the narrative that people could say in Twitter or on news was heavily controlled. So there is sometimes some coordination that the government does to try to influence our views. Uh, in, in my experience working at the Fed, I, I think this is, I don't think this is something that they would do. It could be something that the Washington does, but I, I don't think this is something the Fed would do. I think this is something that they, that, that caught them off guard. But um, I think they're taking advantage of this to try to change the banking system. I say this because they announced this new lending facility that is completely against any basic central banking lending principles. So if you're a central bank, you act as lender of last resort. What you do is you lend to banks that are solvent, you lend against good collateral, and you lend at a penalty rate. That's how you basically act as a backstop for a bank. And you encourage the bank to behave well. Otherwise, you know, they, they don't, they, they go bust. That's how we encourage in our capital, mar in our market-based system, people to improve. But this new lending facility that they seem to suddenly roll out, it's willing to lend to banks regardless of how solvent they are. It's willing to lend undersecured. So for example, if you had $100 in treasuries that declined in value to $80, you could take that treasury and you can still borrow $100 against it. So it's undersecured lend. And they're offering borrowing rates that are, you know, slightly below market, I'd say. So this is, in a sense, socializing the entire banking system, because that means that no matter how badly the bank performs, there's this bailout line here that they can do to basically get uh, sweetheart deals to, to, to uh, support their liquidity. Now, this is something that a central bank has never done before. And what I think it's doing is that it gradually makes the banking sector more dependent upon the Fed and it, cur and it encourages bad behavior. Mm. So Silicon Valley Bank, as we've discussed, wasn't managed very well. And now if this bailout facility was here, let's say last week, they would still be here. So we would still have Silicon Valley Bank and we would have no way of encouraging banks to behave better. Mm. But this is not making you think that the Fed would then, you know, you said it caught them off guard, but could, could they still use it saying like, okay, we wanted to defeat inflation. We wanted, you know, Powell can say, I wanted to be Paul Volcker, but this is out of my hands. I need to save the banking system. So that's why emergency rate cut, we're back to, I don't know, 3%, whatever. Okay, no. So in the market, if you look at this, they're definitely listening to you. So the market is agreeing with you. So they're like, yeah, you know, there's this banking crisis here. The Fed is going to cut rates and look at, let's cut, let's look at the 10 year yield. It's down tremendously, up, up to three and a half percent. So, and if you look at what the short term interest rate futures are pricing, you know, a few days ago, they were thinking they might be 50 basis point hike in March. Now they're back to thinking that there might be cuts later in the year. So, uh, the market looks at this and thinks the Fed is going to be ultra dovish. But I think that's actually the wrong take from this. And I'll tell you why. So the Fed, from everything that I see, is very concerned about inflation. Inflation is a real economy phenomenon. right? So one of the reasons we have inflation is because there's a labor shortage. Uh, wages keep going higher. Wages keep going higher because there's not enough people. Um, well, you know what? Some 
small bank or medium sized bank in California that goes under, that doesn't really change anything. This is something that's very localized and very much part of the financial markets. And I actually think this made the Fed's job much harder. It made the Fed's job much harder, not because there is any banking crisis. It made a job much harder because now the market thinks the Fed is going to cut rates. So what basically happened is that financial conditions have eased. So mortgage rates in the US, they were 7%. Now, if everyone thinks the Fed is going to cut rates, they're going to go back down to 5%. We can easily see the housing market reaccelerate, go back higher. Now, people were not. So loan growth by banks was a pretty slow earlier in the year. Part of it was because interest rates went higher. Now that interest rates go back down, now that that loan growth can reaccelerate, we can have the resurgence of inflation because everyone thinks that the Fed is going to cut rates, and so interest rate, so borrowing costs have already gone down. This makes the Fed's jobs harder, especially because, like I mentioned, I don't really think this is systemic. systemic. Hmm. It makes the Fed's job harder despite of what inflation is going to show tomorrow? It makes the Fed's job harder because it eases financial conditions. The market looks at this and thinks the Fed is going to cut rates. And because the market thinks the Fed is going to cut rates, the borrowing costs of everyone already go down. So uh, that means that it's possible because borrowing costs go down, that the economy reaccelerates and inflation comes back or becomes even more serious. Hmm. Okay. okay. So the 10-year year, it went down, right? So it was 4%. Now it's back to 35 because everyone thinks that the Fed is going to cut rates. Now, in that case, doesn't that mean mortgage rates, rates went back down? And so all the hard work the Fed did to try to slow down the housing market, you know, it doesn't work anymore because the market is convinced that the Fed is going to cut rates, even if the Fed actually doesn't. So that means that um, uh, basically the borrowing costs have gone back down, even though the Fed is trying to make them go back up. Uh, I'm getting higher for longer vibes from what you're saying. <laughs> is that correct? Yeah, yeah. The Fed is trying to do higher for longer. Mm -hmm. you, you think they're going to be successful at that? Like, do, do you think that, I guess Powell, what I've been hearing from the people that I've been talking to is that Powell started, um, Zoltan Poser, one of them, I recently spoke to him and he said uh, that Powell's, um, Powell started this inflation fight by saying Paul Volcker multiple times in his speeches. Uh, and, and so for him to back down would be a hit on central bank um on the central bank's image basically and the central bank's um credibility over the, the whole next generation so he cannot really back down so i mean the but what do you think about that is it, is it still probable for him to pull off a paul volcker uh no no so listen um uh, listen we have Paul Volcker was there because everyone was trying to stop inflation. And uh, they, Paul Volcker was able to do very unpopular things because that the public was fed up with inflation. Now, Jay Powell doesn't have the same amount of public support right now. If he hikes rates too much, if there's too much job loss, I think that people would be angry at the Fed because they, don't, they haven't had a decade of inflation to suffer under like Paul Volcker did. So... I think they will try, but I think that, you know, it's hard to be Paul Volcker today. What the Fed will try, try to do is probably just to keep rates around 5.5% for the next year or two. Huh. Okay, so c can they still defeat inflation by doing that? I mean, c can they, does that, I guess, let me ask it that way. Does, does that break the labor market? Because the what I've understood so far is that if the labor market is not broken, you're not defeating inflation. Or have I gotten that wrong? That's what the Fed says. The Fed says that. So what drives inflation? Now, one of the ways that one of the reasons why prices can go higher is that people have more money to afford higher prices. So let's say the price of coffee went up 20%. Well, if no one could afford it, the price would have to come back down, right? So one of the reasons that we can have persistent inflation is that people continue to have money to spend. They have money to spend because their wages keep going higher. Now that's what Paul that's what Jay Powell is talking about. Everyone keeps making more money. So unless the only way for us to make prices at least not go up as fast is to make sure that we have wages growing a bit slower. The way that we have wages grow slower is that we soften the labor market. 
I think that's going to be hard to do because there's a big change happening in the U.S. and in in the Europe as well, and that is the population is aging, so we don't have as many people who are working today.、Um, labor supply is going to decline going forward, and it's hard to see wages going down if labor supply declines. Is that the same in、uh, in Belgium as well? Do you have like、uh, I guess high wages and high un very high very low unemployment? Yeah. I guess that's pretty much those are the thing that attracts people to Western Europe overall,、um, maybe unconsciously, but like I, I, I would suppose that that is the case. We also had stimulus packages、um, during COVID that that were very sort of supportive of inflation.、Uh, with hand, with hindsight, maybe not the best thing to do, especially with the supply chain issues. Which actually brings me to maybe also talk about that. Like, how do you how do you solve inflation? As a central planner, when it's maybe largely due to supply chain issues and not as much due to the、uh, extra introduced liquidity into the system,、uh, from my perspective, it's very obviously not because of supply. I think that's just propaganda, actually. So here's how. Here's why I think that way.、Um, if you let's say, you know, you have supply and demand, right? If It's supply constrained. Then you will not be able to produce as much as as you could before. So let's say you're a factory and you're producing a hundred cars a year. Now, because of supply constraints, you can't you can't make any more cars, right? Because let's say you can't get steel. So instead of producing a hundred cars, you only produce ninety. The supply of cars decreases, and you know the price goes higher. So that's what a supply shock, negative supply shock, would be. But when we look at the economy overall. It's not producing ninety cars. It's producing a hundred and five. So it's actually producing even more today than it did before.、Hmm. That's not good. What would happen during supply shock? And there's something else to keep in mind as well. There was a little bit of a supply shock around COVID, but it's been getting much better, and that means that it's actually a drag on inflation. Let's think about this in terms of oil. So let's say oil price was is two is one hundred dollars. If it goes up by ten percent, it goes to one hundred and ten dollars, and that adds to inflation, right? Because inflation is the change in prices. So, oil prices was one hundred; it goes down to one hundred and ten. So, price the prices went higher. But let's say the supply constraints eased, and oil goes back from one hundred and ten back to one hundred. That means prices decline. So you'd expect inflation to be negative. So as supply chains improve. Their impact on inflation is negative, negative, so deflationary, because、uh, you're you're judging the change in prices. Mm. Mm.、Um, so you know, but what what I see at least in the U.S. is that inflation remains persistent. So you know, that's that's not what you would see. Expect as the Fed has been saying for the past year, there's a very big demand shock. People actually are buying a lot more stuff.、Mm. Um, what's the situation of inflation in Belgium like? Is it is it a、uh, is it a, Political topic.、Hmm. The, pretty much everything is a political topic, or can be a political topic, but not as much as it is in the U.S. Because our central bank doesn't have the same influence in the country as the European Central Bank has. So the so inflation on on the European European Central Bank level is is very much a political thing. Um, also, because the war is just very close to home for us, right?、Um, mm. so, so definitely, definitely a political thing. But yeah, inflation is still at pretty much the highest levels over here in Belgium.、Um, it's still very much an issue. But what, what I'm hearing from you is basically that to solve inflation, you're going to need、um, tightening in the economy. Is that is that both in the financial economy and in the real economy, or can we go as you suggested in one of your、uh, articles a couple of months ago, maybe about a month ago, or maybe before that? Not sure that that we can have tightening in the financial economy, but loosening in the real economy. Ah,、uh, I think the financial economy and the real economy are separate, but they are related. I think in order to have Tightening in the real economy, you have to have tightening in the financial economy. That's how monetary policy works.、Uh, another thing that could happen is you could have、um, tightening through less through government intervention. So, what could happen, but it's not going to happen, is that the federal government here could spend less money. 
that would be a fiscal tightening uh, through ways that are not monetary policy dependent. Uh, but that's probably not going to be happened. So it seems like the only tool the government has to face this is just basically um, monetary policy. And so that requires interest rates to stay higher for longer. Hmm. Okay. So it's, yeah. So we're back to the full circle to higher for longer, basically. That's yeah, I think that's going to, I think that will happen. That makes your tweet from today then even more so interesting because you say, it's overblown. You know, the issue with the bank was overblown. There's more important things in the economy. So you said you were buying. Yeah. But higher for longer means negative for risk on assets. And so how do you how do you how do you place that? How do you see that? Well, it depends on what you buy. So if you look at when I look at the market just today, you know, March 13th, I'm seeing tremendous sell-offs in resources like uh, let's say oil, let's say steel, let's say uh, miners and so forth. I think that over the next few years, we'll have an inflationary period. So I've been waiting for ways, waiting for shocks in the market where I can go and get these at better better prices. So <clears throat> when I look at when I look at what's happening in the world, it, it looks like one, um, we, we have an inflationary political system, but two, it looks like we are probably going to have a prolonged. Uh, conflict, uh, both um, with, uh, with, I guess, Russia and with China. And if you have a prolonged conflict, if you have war, that's very inflationary, especially for basic commodities. So I think things like that are actually pretty good investments. Um, I see no indication that, you know, we're, we're trying to de-escalate the tensions we're creating in the world. And I see a government that is very much willing to spend as much money as it can and a Fed that might not have the political support to be Volcker. Uh, they can go higher for longer, but they can't be Volcker. So that all leads to a circumstance that, in, in my view, is inflationary. Okay, they don't have the support to do the Volcker uh, um, in terms of inflation, but what if... It, feel free to cut me off when I become sort of a crazy conspiracy theorist on the internet because I spend too much time online. But <laughs> what if there's a currency war going on where the Fed has to keep hiking more than the other central banks to keep its currency the 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 cleanest the cleanest shirt in in the laundry basket? Uh, so I think there could be a currency war uh, in the coming years, but today it's it's hard to see that because the the dollar is just so much more dominant than other people. Um, look at China. Let's say China becomes our closest competitor. China owns trillions of dollars of treasuries, right? If your currency is so great, why do you have to own so many dollars? So in the future, there could be a situation where um, there could be more competition for the dollar, but that's in the future. Today, uh, I think today, it's still very much a dollar-driven world. And there are good reasons for this as well. Let's say there actually is conflict and war in the world. If you're in Europe, don't you want to get your money farther away from the conflict? Nothing safer than the U.S., which is between two oceans, has a very big military as well. So the U.S., I think, not just because of the dollar system, but because of its many geopolitical advantages, being a very safe place, far from uh, basically a dominant power within that part of the world, is, is a safe haven for a lot of money. So why not just take the five percent on 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 the treasury or whatever it is four percent? Yeah, yeah, mm, yeah. Uh, that's not a bad that's not a bad thing. Um, so, but if you look at let's say on on oil or on a mining company or something like that, they can offer you a higher than five percent dividend if you are let's say if you buy let's say an oil royalty company for example, they are they can offer you ten percent and so forth, and you have upside. You have some downside risk because oil could, prices can implode, but you also have sizable upside risk in case you have, let's say, geopolitical conflict in the Middle East, or if um, oil is weaponized and if oil prices go higher, then you have some more upside. So I think that 5% risk-free from the U.S. Treasury is a really good deal. Um, but if you have a little bit more risk appetite, you could also think about things that are, let's say, uh, let's say resource stocks that have good dividends because you also get some more upside there. Hmm. So, so the the knee jerk reaction that we saw to the to the banking news, where it was you know long gold, 
short everything even closely correlated to risk and especially energy you're, you're pretty I'm, much honestly, against that i'm not sure gold is that good, good a deal anymore I, I think gold i mean has to go higher but listen is gold is gold really uh, uh an alternative to let's say a fiat system I, I say that because you know what people think of as money really changes over time and depends on culture as well um you know if you go to some countries back in the day, what do you use to back your money? It, it's not it's uh, it's not necessarily gold. It, it could be things like bronze. It could be food. It could be cattle and so forth. Over the past, uh, let's say, a few hundred years in the Western world, uh, gold was considered to be money. But that's just the culture back then. If you grow up, if you are someone who grew up today, like a, I think a, a Zoomer or something like that, you know, maybe you think crypto is is much more money like maybe Bitcoin is more much more money like than gold. So there's a big cultural shift there. So I think we have to be aware of that. Now, there are always there are some things that people think of as money. And what that is, is really going to depend on what era you're born, where you live, and, and just kind of your cultural background. Um, I'm not sure that that most people think about okay gold is going to be the next money so if we have banking crisis let's buy gold because that's going to be money i guess it, it it's sort of this belief it's it's almost as if if we as a collective have agreed on okay gold is just a safe place to be so if there's trouble let's all go into gold uh mm -hmm. and and could could that be moving gold up right now um i think what what could be moving gold up is just some good diversification of from uh from big central banks that what big central banks have own a lot of dollars maybe they want to diversify a little bit now the gold market is, is you know not as deep as the treasury market so you mm -hmm. just have a little bit of diversification and just for today in particular it looks like the dollar is weakening a bit and uh i think when that happens you have commodities like gold tend to go up a bit in price mm -hmm. okay so, but if i understand correctly so to go back to to that tweet that you say you've been buying it's um it is. Can you call it risk on assets? Then what the, the, what what you've been buying? What I'm what I've really noticed today is that we had the broad index open down slightly a lot, but let's say steel companies and U.S. based steel companies, which I bought some, uh, they, they did fine. So uh, you know, I, I I think that there's a there seems to be a good market for for uh, for those companies right now. Mm. That's because they're cash flow producing businesses specifically or, or is it because there's steel businesses specifically because you have That's a lot of brewing sure in both. the market I, I think that i think part of that is that some people perceive so i think that we are going to have a bigger conflict in the world and you know if you have war you, you need steel and mm -hmm. um you know we are going to be u.s based so this like poly chains may not work as well in the future so you know if you are a completely u.s based steel maker you're you're going to have some benefit there okay okay what, what what percentage of your portfolio is exposed to the 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 i guess the risk of you being wrong on their no being turmoil in the market if that makes sense like what, what I, I guess the real question is how are, how are you managing that risk of taking that bad and and what percentage do, are you betting on well, I mean, if you're wrong, then yeah, you just you want to size your position the right way, like you mentioned. You don't want to have a portfolio that's too overexposed to, to one thing. Uh, so yeah, you want to say I I wouldn't ever hold anything more than let's say one or two percent in a single stock. But it, from my perspective, if it continues to grow, I I don't I don't rebalance. Mm -hmm. So you just I would limit my risk by by doing that. And you know, um, you you also have to think about if the macro situation changes. Uh, let's say you immediately tomorrow have a big peace deal. Well. Be peace deal with Russia if the federal government decides that you know what we're not going to do deficit spending anymore we're going to have a balanced budget those are all things that have big impacts on asset prices and you have to reevaluate so th that's how I would approach that hmm. we the, the the thing that I um sort of as a as a gambling addict uh <laughs> like dabbling in is, is is exploration companies and and not um I guess what matters for those exploration companies is that those are non-cash flow generating businesses, but they are cash eating businesses. Um, in in sort of a, a a frothy market, how do how do you look at those uh, at, at at those plays? Are you thinking about something like tech? 
No, no, I'm talking about exploration. So natural resource exploration companies, you know, companies. No, no, I, I, I don't, I don't buy any of those. I, I, those are just really risky and I don't have the expertise to, to look into that. So I, I always go for the majors, uh, the majors, like, you know, big well-known companies. If I did a minor, let's say a BHP, a Valet or, uh, you know, Real Tinto, those in my view are, are better um, because so on the first hand, you're not going to get as much upside. It's totally true. If you buy a small no-name explorer no one has ever heard of, they could explode higher, but they could also go to zero. The big uh, the big companies are good for me because they're very liquid. You can easily get in and get out. And I think that, you know, they looking at what they offer right now, they I mean, it looks like they have pretty good dividends and that could change depending on commodity prices. So um, I, I don't see any reason to, to take all that risk for something that I don't understand. If I was someone who was on the ground, have deep expertise in this, I can make a judgment, but I, I can't. I, I don't know. I wish I was as smart as you and knew that last year, but uh, <laughs> you're right, though. You're right. Um, Hard to know. Yeah. Well, you, I guess you end up learning over time. So it's what's be, what's been happening to me. What about the time frame on on on? Sorry for going back so much to that tweet, but it's a, it, it seems like it shocked Twitter as well, where he's saying I'm buying. What was your time frame on the purchases that you made today? No, I know. I, I want to hold. I want to hold these and just kind of ride through the cycle. So I think we're going to have a world where inflation is going to be higher for the next at least five years. So uh, I would be happy holding these for. I I hope that okay you can just kind of ride through collect some cash flow collect some dividends and ride through for the next few years as we go through this probably pretty uh pretty inflationary cycle and so one thing i want to note is that inflation it's always a um a cultural phenomenon so if you're the government you can easily create inflation by just giving everyone stimmies right you give everyone free money they're going to go spend it you have inflation and you can easily create deflation. How do you do that? You can jack up interest rates to 20%. You can raise taxes and so forth. You have deflation. So if you want to know whether or not we are in a world that's inflationary or deflationary, you want to see what the culture is like. Now, today, we have a culture, at least in the US, where people like free stuff and they don't like pain. And the government is easy, very willing to accommodate that. So today, we have this very minor bank, cut Silicon Valley Bank, not that big of a deal in the market, fail when the government's there basically bailing everyone out, um, all the depositors out, and then putting out a new bailout facility for all the commercial banks. So they're willing they're willing to uh, take away any pain. And that only means one thing, and that means that inflation will continue. Mm. Because, uh, well, in order to get rid of inflation, you need some pain. And the way that this worked in the bulk area era was that... Uh, the guy before Volcker, his name was Arthur Burns. And whenever he hiked rates to try to get inflation under control, people would complain that, you know, you're causing unemployment, you're being mean, so forth. And so he always relented. It was only after they had 10 years of super high inflation that they're like, okay, okay, do whatever it takes, get inflation under control. Yeah. And then Volcker came and he jacked up interest rates. We are not anywhere close to Volcker like uh Volker like and Volker like uh, intolerance yet. So we are still at a place where we're we're like, yeah, inflation not so bad, guys. But um, that will change in a few years, I think. I can definitely sort of um, see myself in the crowd that likes free stuff and no pain. I, I definitely I belong in that crowd. But it's um, can we go through free stuff and no pain for much longer, given how much we've underinvested in the exploration and development of natural resource assets? Yeah, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I am not an expert at that area. I only go mm -hmm. by what I hear. It sounds like we underinvested. Uh, so, um, but so it sounds pretty compelling to me. But I also know that you know a lot of the oil prices and so forth haven't gone up that much this year. So. Uh, it's 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 one factor, but it's not the only factor. Hmm. So, but you still believe that it's sort of a central planner's or a central bank's job to manage those markets, and you still have trust that the Fed is 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 going to manage them in a way that we don't come in in like a real commodity supply shortage. So, people say that. So, I don't think we have a supply negative supply shock right now, but even if we did. I think the central bank could still lower inflation. Uh, let's just think about this for one minute. Let's say 
Federal Reserve hikes rates to 50%. Now, I don't care how much of a shortage you have. You hike rates to 50%, the price is going to go down. So uh, they can do that. It's just whether or not the, you're willing to take the pain. Hmm. When I say supply shortages, I really mean commodity supply shortage, like copper, for example, and and and, and these yeah. things. And not right now, but like over the coming decade, as we have the green agenda and everything, demand going up, but supply not necessarily going up. Yeah, there's going to be huge demand, government driven. And the thing about government driven is that they don't care about the price. So they're just print and spend. So I think that that's part of the reason why we could have an inflationary um, decade. Hmm. Okay, okay. Is it commodity super cycle does that does that sound a little uh, bit no, too so much I, for you? I, I'm, I'm not an expert on the supply side of commodities i only know what i see on the demand side which is uh, government policy and mm. so that that's what that's what i focus on mm. Mm. okay i have to okay. rely on other people to to understand what the supply side is and they seem to be saying the same thing you're saying which is that there's some significant underinvestment so the supply may not be able to keep up mm. Mm. okay we, I went through the, the most of the points that I wanted to go through today. What, what do you think is is more important than 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 the thing, or maybe as important as the things that we're talking about here today? But like nobody ever brings up, or that I'm missing here, uh, but that you're paying attention to. So I think we pay too much attention to the central banks. We need to pay more attention to the government because the government spends money. Right. And how does it spend money? It, it just kind of creates it. So, and more importantly, the government really doesn't care about what it spends money on. It, there's no profit or loss. It's purely politically driven. So we want to pay attention to whether or not um, the government continues to spend more money than it takes in taxes, because that's very inflationary. Now in the US, this is a huge problem because uh, the most recent projections from the government itself actually is that we have continued deficit spending that's very high for the next decade. And, you know, that means the government's going to print money and spend it. And that is that is a fairly inflationary force. This is very different than what happened in the past 20 years. In the U.S., for a long time, the people cared about having a balanced budget. So if you had the government spend too much money, you'd have people complain. No one does that anymore. Everyone's like, yeah, spend money, but give it to me. So that changes the culture. And that means that... Um, you know, over time, what the Fed does will be less influential. Let's think about it this way. The Fed wants to slow the economy down by raising interest rates. In theory, let's say you are a person or a business person, you see interest rates go up to 10%, and maybe you don't want to borrow as much, want to invest as much. You're, you're slowing down your business activity. It works. Yeah. Let's think about the government now. Is it going to see, oh my God, interest rates are 10%. I'm not going to do simis. No, it's, it doesn't care about interest rates. Who cares, right? Uh, the They want to get reelected. And the way you get reelected is to give people money. Hmm. So pay attention to who spends the money and what they're spending that money on is basically, is yeah. basically what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Culturally, though, do we want to spend money on 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 sort of the, the green agenda and what the, I mean because you say pay attention to what they're spending that's what they're spending money on right now right yeah in the Europe and and uh, so in the U.S. we're a little bit different now we we are not all all in on the green agenda uh, some people are some people aren't it's it's more controversial I think in Canada and the eurozone I think uh, from what I understand everyone is all in uh, here it's not not as much hmm. Hmm. yeah yeah it's it, Weird. I mean, the sentiment towards nuclear energy is also improving greatly, especially after what's been happening, like in, in Germany, with their investments in in renewable energy and the results that they've gotten out of it. Um, so the sentiment is also shifting at least a little bit, at least based on the on the headlines um, in Europe. So it'd be interesting to see what that happens. Well. I think I'm all out of questions. I want to sort of go through the points that I wrote down and you tell me if I got something wrong, uh, what I got some, and, and, and if I missed something as well, then is, is that okay with you? Sure. Okay. Uh, I guess we, we started off by talking about the bank. So you said the current issue is, is not, um, is not like a system problem. It's not going to be too big. Contagion is not, is not likely because this was very localized to San Francisco, California, because it's, um, it's a local bank. Um, not not a huge bank either, just a, a badly run business that failed. Yes, I agree. 
So that was, a, that was sort of the first point. Uh, then we talked about, um, the, you know, interest rates, what, what Powell is going to do. The conclusion was, again, higher for longer um, for the interest rates, but also for inflation. So you say it's going to be an inflationary decade, um, but Powell is not going to be able to pull a Paul Volcker because he doesn't have the, um, he doesn't have the, 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 the support from, from the people, basically, in the U.S., that was sort of the next point that I wrote down. Um, and then we talked about what, you, what you're what you buying. So you said you're buying stuff like steel, uh, oil companies that pay good dividends, you know, good companies, cash flow generating companies because of the dividends, because you think we're going into an inflationary um, decade. And, um, and, 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 that, and that was basically... That was basically it. And then we closed it off by saying that there was an important point that I circled. Pay attention to who spends the money and what they're spending it on. So don't pay too much as much attention on what Powell is going to do next week or this week or next month or next year. Pay attention on who's spending the money, the government, and what is the government spending the money on. So a lot of time from yeah, you want to focus on that, at least in the US. Uh, yeah. in the Europe, in, in Europe as well. I think you guys are going to spend a lot of money too. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's pretty much the things that I that I had in mind to talk about. Would, is this something I'm missing? Something else that you wanted to talk about today? No, I mean, if you guys are interested in learning more about, uh, let's say, central banking, you can check out my book, centralbanking101.com, also available in Europe, best-selling mm -hmm. book on Amazon. And if you're interested in the financial markets, I also have an online course called Markets 101, where I teach about macro trading and asset classes. So check that out as well if you guys are interested in the markets. Oh, for sure. It's called Fed. Your website's called fedguy.com. Fedguy yep. Um, you just wrote an article hidden to the market. It was basically talking about what we talked about today. And um, exactly. if I may give you a little bit of criticism is just please write more. These things are very <laughs> there. I mean, you know, you laugh, but to someone like me, and I think a lot of people would agree, it's like this is very helpful to to get an understanding of how the system works. There were a couple of pieces, especially a couple of months ago, Um January credit boom that was a very good one. Trap liquidity also super good. Um, quantitative buybacks that was in October last year. Stuff like that. There, uh, to me personally, but again, I think a lot of people would agree that, that those are really good pieces, and I think I think you're doing a, a very good service to the to the community. Thanks, thanks. I, I will try to keep up. And well, thanks have, a lot. If you have any questions or you know, feel free to reach out. I, I will try to try to help you in any way that I can. Oh, th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that offer. And thank you for, for being here today, investing in time with me.